picture this I'm a bag of dicks, put me to your lips I am sick, I will punch a baby bear in his shit Give me lip, I'ma send you to the yard Get a stick, make a switch I can end the conversation real quick I am crack, I ain't lying, kick a lion in this crack I'm the shit, I will fall off in your crib Take a shit, hit your mama on the booty Kick your dog, fuck your bitch That boy dressed up like you said on and took pictures with your kids We the best, we will come Tom Boyne was born on the 20th April 1971 in Dublin Ireland. He's an Irish author. Since now he published more than 20 romans and some other short stories. John Boyne got famous with this book. We will introduce later The Boy in a Striped Pajama. Schmuel is a young Jew who was forced to move with his family in the KZ in Poland. Bruno is a young German boy who was used to live in Germany. But because of his dead new job, he was forced to go to the KZ. He wasn't very happy with the situation, but he has to handle it. Bruno also likes very much to discover new places. And he also likes to meet with Schmuel at the fence. Bruno's father served as a German Nazi officer during World War II. He was very strict to uh, Bruno. And he didn't really like Jews at all, he thought they were not people at all. Bruno's mother cared about her kids a lot, but from time to time she's getting more and more mental instable. That's because they, they moved to the KZ and in the end of the book she, uh, she wanted to drive back to their normal home in Berlin. Gretel is Bruno's sister. Bruno doesn't really like Gretel because she's sometimes very annoying. Also, he's telling her all the time that she's a hopeless case. Now we will tell you something about the book The Boy in the Striped Pyjama. The Boy in the Striped Pyjama tells the story of Bruno, a young German boy growing up during World War II. He enjoyed reading adventure stories and going on expeditions to explore the lesser known corners of his family's massive house in Berlin. Also, his father served as an officer at German Nazi party. Bruno understood little about his work, neither did he understood anything about the war. He really likes to uh, see the struggle and bustle of Berlin and he likes to meet with his friends Martin, Karl and Daniel. One day Bruno came home from school and found the family at home. Maid Maria, the housemaid, packing his belongings. Bruno's mother explained that father would soon begin a new job and that the family has need to move immediately. Several days later the family Ride with the train and travel to the new home. Bruno was not very happy about the new house. Not only it was smaller than the Berlin home, but it also struck him as cold and lonely. And to make matters worse, there were soldiers everywhere. Bruno searched for some interesting corners in the house, but he couldn't find something. On the day of the family's arrival, Bruno looked out of the window of his new bedroom. On the other side of a very tall fence that is stretched far into the distance, he saw a large number of boys and men of all ages, wearing striped pajamas and matching caps. Bruno wanted to uh, consult his sister about the new home. Gretel knew that the new home was called Outwith, in German Outwith, Auswisch. But other than Bruno, she also remained in the dark. Bruno decided to speak with father. After boiling his frustration about the new house and arguing for the family's return to Berlin, Bruno asked who the people on the other side of the fence were. Father explained that they were not people at all and that Bruno shouldn't worry about them. Bruno persisted in his complaints about the new house. One day, he tried to get Maria, the housemaid, to express disapproval of the family's move, but she refused. She 
told Bruno that father was a good man and that he helped her and her family in the time of greatest need. For this reason, she would not speak a word against him. Maria had never told Bruno about her life before and her story made him realize that she was a complete person with her own life history and experience. Weeks passed and Bruno struggled to keep himself occupied. One day he decided to erect a tile swing. While playing on his new swing, Bruno fell and scrapped his leg. An older Jewish man named Pavel saw the accident from the kitchen window. Pavel, who used to be a doctor but now helped prepare and serve the family's meal, brought Bruno in and dressed his wound. Bruno felt grateful for Pavel's help, but he also wondered why a doctor bothered work as a servant. More weeks passed and Bruno decided to go exploring in the afternoon after history and geography lesson with his tutor, Herr List. Bruno set out walking along the fence that he could see from his window. He walked for an hour before coming upon a boy who introduced himself as Schmuel. Bruno and Schmuel sat on either side of the fence and told each other about their lives. Schmuel explained how his family had been forced to move into grounded ghettos and then again to get on a train to come to this place and work in this camp in Poland. Excited to have made a friend, Bruno returned to the same spot along the fence nearly every day over the coming weeks and months. As time passed, Bruno noticed that Schmuel grew thinner and weaker. His skin looked increasingly grey. Bruno started to stealing bread and cheese for his hungry friend. One day, in the midst of preparation for a party to celebrate father's birthday, Bruno walked into the kitchen and found Schwul there polishing glasses. Bruno gave Schwul some chicken to eat, but a young soldier named Lieutenant Kotler came in and called Schwul in the act. Bruno hated and feared Lieutenant Kotler, who seemed especially cruel. In a moment of panic, Bruno denied knowing Schmuel and Lieutenant Kotler pretended to teach Schmuel a lesson later. Schmuel didn't appear at the fence for nearly a week. And when he did, he had bruises everywhere. Oh no! A year after the family's arrival at Outworth, mother grew increasingly listless and frustrated about their life there. When both children got lice, mother convinced father that it was time for her to take the kids back to Berlin. Bruno told Schmuel the bad news about the impending departure and he lamented the fact that they never got to play together properly. Schmuel had bad news on his own. His father had gone missing. The two boys made a plan for the last day together. Schmuel would bring a pair of striped pajamas and Bruno would crawl through the small opening at the bottom of the fence in disguise to help the, to find his friend's father. Bruno and Schmuel enacted their plan the following day. After searching in vain for clues that would lead to Schmuel's missing father, Bruno wanted to go home. Just then, a group of soldiers surrounded the area in which Bruno and Schmuel stood and forced everyone to march in a long dark building. As the doors were locked and terror erupted the two boys, Bruno took Schmuel's hand and told him that he was his best friend. If you want to know the ending, you will have to buy the book, read the book and enjoy the book. Now we will read our favorite scenes from the book. He lay flat out across the center of the tire and used his feet to give himself a push off the ground. Every time the tire swung back, 
which rose in the air and narrowly avoided hitting the trunk of the tree itself. But it still came close enough for Bruno to use his feet to kick himself even faster and higher on the next swing. This worked very well until his grip on the tire slipped away a little just as he kicked the tree. Before he knew it his body was turning inside and he fell downwards on foot still inside the rim while he landed face down on the ground beneath him with the thought. Everything went, went black for a moment and then came back into focus. He sat up on the ground just as the tire swung back and hit him on the head and he let out your yelp and moved out of his way. When he stood up he could feel that his arm and leg were both very sore and he had fallen heavily on them. But they weren't so sore that they might be broke. He inspected his hand and it was covered in scratches and when he looked at his elbow he couldn't see a nasty cut. His leg felt worse though and when he looked down at his knee just below where his shorts ended there was a white gash which seemed to have been waiting for him to look at because once all the attention was focused on it it started to bleed rather badly. Oh dear, said Bro Bruno out loud, staring at it and wondering what he should do next. He didn't have to wonder for long though, because the swing that he had built was on the same side of the house as the kitchen, and Pavel, the waiter, who had helped him find the tire, had been peeling potatoes while standing at the window and had seen the accident take place. When Bruno looked up again, he saw Pebble coming quickly towards him. And only when he arrived did he feel confident enough to let the woozy feeling that was surrounding him taking him over completely. He fell a little but didn't land on the ground this time, as Pebble scooped him up. I don't know what happened, he said. It didn't seem dangerous at all. You were going too high, said Pebble in a quiet voice that immediately made Bruno feel safe. I could, I could see it. I thought that at any time you were going to suffer a mischief. And I did, said Bruno. You certainly did. Pebble carried him across the lawn and back towards the house, taking him into the kitchen and settling him up on one of the wooden chairs. Where's mother? asked Bruno, looking around for the first person he usually searched for when he would had an accident. Your mother hasn't returned yet. I'm afraid, said Pebble, but who was kneeling on the floor in front of him and examining the, the knee. I'm on the only one here. What's going to happen then? asked Bruno, beginning to panic slightly, an emotion that might encourage tears. I might bleed to death. Pebble gave a gentle laugh and shook his head. You're not going to bleed to death, he said, pulling a stool across and getting Bruno's leg on it. Don't move for a moment. There's a first aid box over there. Bruno watched as he moved around the kitchen pulling the green first aid box from a cupboard and filling a small bowl with water, testing it first with his fingers to make sure that it wasn't cold, too cold. Will I need to go to hospital? asked Bruno. No, no, said Pebble when he returned to his kneeling position, dipping a dry cloth into the bowl and touching it gently to Bruno's knee, which made him wince in pain despite in the fact that it wasn't really all that painful. It's only a small cut. It won't even need stitches. Bruno is happy to find Shmoo's father. 
Shmuel's father was lost a couple days ago and now Bruno and Shmuel are in the KZ and are searching for the father. And now I am reading a scene from the book. He had thought that there would be a shop in the center and maybe a small coffee like this one in Berlin. He had wondered where there would be a fruit or vegetable stall. As it turned out, all the things that he thought he would be there were. There were no growing up sittings on rocking chairs on the approaches. On the children's and the children's went playing games in groups. And not only there wasn't a fruit vegetable stall, but there wasn't also a cafe either, like there had been back in Berlin. Instead there were crowds of people sitting together in groups and staring at the ground, looking horrible, sad. They all had one thing in common. They were all terrible skinny and their eyes were sunken and they all had shaved heads. Which Bruno thought must have been had an outbreak of lies here too. In one corner Bruno could see three soldiers who seemed to be in charge of a group of about 20 men. They were shouting at them and some of the men had fallen to their knees and were remaining there with the heads and only the heads. In another cell he could see more soldiers standing around and laughing and looking the barrels of the guns, aiming them in random directions. But not firing them. In fact, everywhere he looked he could see two different types of people, either happy, laughing and they were shooting at soldiers and the ones who were unhappy and who cried. I don't like this here, said Bruno after a while. Neither I do, said Shmuel. I think I would go home, said Bruno. Shmuel stopped walking and stared at him. But Papa, he said. You said you will help me to find him. Bruno thought about it. He had promised his friend that he wasn't the sort to go back on a promise especially when it was the last time that they were going to see each other. All right, he said. All thought he felt a lot less confident now than he had before. But where should we look? he asked. You said we will need to find evidence. Who was feeling very upset because he thought that if Bruno didn't help him, then who would? No one. Evidence, yes, said Bruno, nodding his head. You are right, let's start looking. So Bruno kept his word and the two boys spent an hour and a half searching the camp looking for evidence. They weren't sure exactly what they were looking for, but Bruno kept stating that a good explorer would know when he found it. But it didn't find anything. All that might him give a clue to Shmuel's papa disappeared and it started to get darker and darker. Bruno looked up at the sky and it looked like it made rain. Again, I'm sorry Shmuel, he said eventually. I'm sorry we didn't find the evidence. Shmuel nodded his head sadly. He wasn't really surprised, he hadn't really expected to, but it had been a nice having his friend over to see where, the, where he lived all the same. I think I should go home, said Bruno. Will you walk back to the fence with me? asked Bruno. Shmuel opened his mouth to answer, but right at the moment there was a loud whistle and ten soldiers more than Bruno had ever seen created together in one place before, surrounded an area of the camp. The area in which Bruno and Shmuel were standing. What's happening? whispered Bruno. What's going on? It happens sometimes, said Shmuel. They make people go on marches. Marches? said Bruno. What's that? I can go for a march. I have to be home for dinner. It's like it's... It's roast beef tonight. I like roast beef, so I should go now. Shh, 
said Shmuel. Don't say anything or get angry. Bruno fronted but was relieved that all the people in striped pajama from this part of the camp were gathering together now. Most of them being pushed together by soldiers, so Shmuel were hidden in the center of them and couldn't see them. He didn't know, but everyone looked so frightened. And if you like to know the whole story, buy a book. Read the book and enjoy it. Do you ever wanted to read the book The Boy in the Striped Pyjama? Yeah! But you do not have enough money to buy it? Yeah! Now we will hear something from two people who spent their own money to read this book. Yeah! Did you like the book? As I already said, I was really surprised by the book. I really liked the book, although it was not a real war story. The third question, is the story true? Personally, I would say no, it felt really invented. Which age group is this book for? I would say the book is for people which are 12 years or older. What intention did the author have? Hmm, that's a hard question. I think the author wants to tell a sad story. And the actions of the Nazis in the Second World War were really sad. Uh, maybe he also wanted to say that the hate against the Jews were pointless. Do you think Bruno's father was convinced by the Nazis or did he make this job only for the money? So in my opinion, the father was convinced by the Nazis. There were many scenes where you could see he supported the Nazis. Markus, what do you think? Which group of people would read the book? That's a hard question, because everyone has a different taste in the books. Um, I also didn't know that I would like this kind of book. Markus Bär, the last question now. Where can you buy this book? Ah, that's easy. The book is normally available in every bookstore or in every library you know. Uh, the book is very famous, so it's not that hard to find it. Why did you want to read this book? I wanted to read The Boy in the Striped Pyjama because many people recommended it to me. I wanted to give it a try. And first I bought it in the English version. And to improve my English skills. And after I read the English version, I bought the German version too to understand the scenario better. So Elias, did you like the book? I like to read the book very much, Markus. Especially because of the good writing skills from the author. The author wrote the book very understandable and I also could make a scenario in my own head. So do you think the story is true? Hmm. Let me think, Markus. So, there was a KZ in Auschwitz in real. But I do not think that all the scenarios that were explained in the book were 100% real. It's not based on a true story. But the fact that the commandant at Auschwitz did bring the family, including the children, to the camp was real. So it happened real. To which age group would you recommend this book? My personal opinion is from the age 10 to 100. I think it's a very good book for young people because the book is written in a very good language for young boys and girls. And it's also very informative for the younger, for the older generation. What do you think was the intention of the author when he wrote this book? Yo, that's a very good question, Markus. I think that the author would like to tell the story about KZ and Auschwitz. He wanted that the younger and older generation get information about KZ and how they are living in the KZ. So Elias, do you think Bruno's father joined the Nazis because he was convinced of them? Or did he just wanted some money? I think that Bruno's father really thought that the Jews were not people at all. I think that this is not a very good altitude 
The father also wanted to get in a high position in his job. And even Adolf <laughs> getting for dinner in his house. So for the last question, where can I buy this book? Ha 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 ha! What a silly question! You can buy this book for 755 on Amazon. And if you're using Kindle, you can get it for only 649 euros. That is not very much. Picture this, I'm a bag of dicks, put me to your lips, I am sick. I will punch a baby bear in his shit. Give me lip, I'ma send you to the yard, get a stick, Even make a switch. I can hear the conversation real quick. I am crack, I ain't lying, kick a lion in this crack. I'm the shit, I will fall off in your grill, take a shit. Hit your mama on the booty, kick your dog, fuck your bitch. Hey, we're dressed up, he said I had took pictures with your kids. We the best, we will cut a frowning face in your chest, little wench. I'ma mention a big fresh, I'm a man. Get correct, I will walk into a court while they wreck Screaming yes, I am guilty motherfuckers, I am dead Hey, you wanna hear a good joke? Nobody speak, nobody get choked